um, as context to get us started, uh, we really only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try and go as fast as I can um, and give you as much uh, content as possible in that period of time. Uh, but as an intro, I'm Christina Cordova. Um, I've joined engineering-driven technology startups like Stripe, Notion, uh, Linear, anywhere from first to 40th employee. Um, and I'm now at Linear, which is a system for modern product development, helping teams streamline issues, projects, and product roadmaps. Um, so if you have questions uh, throughout this presentation, just use the Q&A function in Zoom down below um, to ask your questions. And then, you know, the last 10 minutes or so, I'll go through and answer them at the end. So uh, let's get started. Um, so first, uh, we talk a lot about non-technical, and that's uh, about, you know, what this entire talk is about, being non-technical, how to get more technical. So first, I'll talk a little bit about, like, what does that mean um, to me? Uh, right now, I'm generally holding the word technical to refer to roles that kind of require specialized knowledge or skill in a technical area. Um, in most technology companies, that would refer to roles like software engineering or data science or design, and non-technical would refer to basically all of the other roles outside of that, including you know, sales, support, operations, finance, legal, partnerships. Um, and I've generally disliked the term non-technical, so I hate to use it, but I feel like that's what so many other people use. So uh, it just groups all of these functions together as if they're the same. Um, and I can tell you from experience that legal and sales are very different skill sets um, in a given company. And, um, you know, they are going to interact with people in technical functions in different ways. Um, but that's kind of how I define it. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit more today about how to kind of up level your technical skill set in working with a lot of people who are quite technical. Um, and to share a little bit about uh, really what this meant for me, um, I joined Stripe as the 28th hire. And from what I can remember at that time, we had just a handful of like non-technical hires. Um, it was our COO, our general counsel, and one person on risk and me on partnerships. So, you know, four people out of a 28 person company who, you know, weren't building the product exclusively uh, with their time. And I was interviewing for my role there. And one of my interviewers asked me like what partnerships even was, and I had to explain it. Um, of course, that person was in the engineering function. I think I interviewed with, you know, maybe one person who wasn't an engineer. Um, and most people uh, at the company had no idea what I was actually going to do for the company when I was hired. Um, and in joining a company that is building a product like for engineers, by engineers, like as you can see here, this is like the very early kind of Stripe website. Um, and it literally says like payments for developers um, on the homepage from, from 2012. And first you realize that it's, you know, incredibly important uh, in joining a company like that to understand the mindset and language of the engineers around you. Um, they're your colleagues. Um, you need to ultimately work with them to accomplish your goals. And then second, you also want to understand the mindset and language of your customers. Um, so across engineering, product design, and data orgs, like whoever you are thinking about selling to, marketing to, supporting, um, you know, you ultimately want to do that without needing to bring a technical counterpart with you wherever you go. So today, like I'll share a few lessons for how I was able to increase my own technical depth in joining a lot of these early stage companies um, in a non-technical role. Um, we'll talk about lesson one, uh, which is RTFM. Uh, this is short for read the fucking manual. And it might sound harsh, um, but it's typically used to reply to a really basic question where the answer is easily found in the documentation. So first and foremost, to become more technical, you should just read your own company's documentation or documentation from a company that you really admire. Um, and it's easy to just ask a technical counterpart questions about how the product works, but you should first attempt to self-serve and learn from what's available to everyone. And that's precisely why documentation and tutorials exist. 
I think documentation for a product like Linear is actually a great place to start. Um, as a product, it's made for engineers, designers, and product builders, but it doesn't actually require you to code in order to use the product and can be easily understood by people and functions adjacent to engineering, product, and design. Like if you're in marketing or support or sales, um, you can very easily read this kind of documentation, which would be the same documentation that a technical counterpart would read um, and understand how to use the product. Then you can move on to documentation for a product that is more oriented towards like a highly technical uh, user that maybe requires some kind of coding skills. So when I was interviewing for my role at Stripe, I was reading through this documentation to understand the components of like a charge object. Um, so that's like an ID, an amount, a currency. You can understand you would need all those components to actually charge a credit card. Um, and it's really easy as a non-technical person to write this off and say, like, I'm in partnerships, like, why do I need to know this? This is not my job. But in reality, everyone should understand how a product works. And that really means going back to the fundamentals and reading documentation just like a customer would. And a good test of whether documentation is any good is whether you can easily understand the component parts. Um, so this is actually like a really great test for people who are building documentation is like, is it readable? Is it understandable? Um, and that's where you can also offer up feedback on how that documentation could be better. Now, let's assume you've read the documentation, but you still have questions or your customers have questions and you don't know the answers to them. Um, ultimately, it's the job of the engineering product and design teams to build products and not to answer all of your questions. Um, so in general, like if you have questions that are not answered by the documentation, it's perfectly fine to ask, you know, engineering product design teams, but you should then make an effort to document those answers for everyone else, because there will certainly be someone who comes after you who has the exact same question. And I remember early on in my time at Stripe realizing that there were a lot of these questions that were, um, you know, asked by a partner um, that were like pretty technical questions. And there just weren't enough engineers who could join calls with me um, and help be a technical counterpart. There was no one who had a role like partner engineer or sales engineer at the time. Um, so that just didn't really exist. And I couldn't take someone off of building the product just to come with me to a meeting. Um, so engineers on your team are an incredibly important resource. And the reality is that for a lot of companies, especially at early stage where you don't have like specialized roles, um, they're not like your resource. Like they don't report to you. They may not even align to like your goals or objectives in the company. So it's worth treating every interaction as if you're getting a favor um, because often you are. And when I would get help and support from the engineering team to understand how a product worked under the hood, I wouldn't just take that back and document it. I would also test my own understanding of what was communicated to me. The easiest way to do that is to ask an engineer if you can play it back to them. So I would, for example, take um, an API and describe how that API worked back to an engineer. And I'd ask them, you know, is how I described it to you how you would describe that to another engineer? And sometimes they would whiteboard how it worked because maybe I didn't understand it. Um, and other times they would tell me to make changes that felt like relatively subtle. Uh, like an example would be something like, you know, instead of documentation, they'd say you should use the word docs because that's how engineers generally refer to it. But the subtle changes do ultimately make a difference in how you're perceived. And there were several times when I was on my team working with engineers externally. Um, so they didn't necessarily know my role, but I was in a meeting. Um, and they would ask me like, oh, are you are you on the engineering team or are you on the product team? And you know, when I was on a team that you know was not nowhere near uh, engineering product and design. Um, and that's ultimately your goal. You want to be confused for someone with more technical fluency than you really have because you learned how to speak the language. Uh, but you won't ultimately learn how to do that if you don't test it with someone on your own team to really probe for the feedback. A great additional resource for like understanding technical concepts more broadly um, is technically.dev, which breaks down concepts like 
how do databases work? Uh, what's an API? Um, how do LLMs work? How does ChatGPT work? Um, so if you've either like wondered those things um, because you use those products or maybe people that you tend to work with talk about those products and you don't exactly understand like what's under the hood, how to work with them, um, it's really helpful to come to a site like this and read an article about you know, how do how do databases work like if you want to understand how these applications and services work and speak to them more fluently it's a really great place to start without having to ask you know again an engineer to describe like how does this work from you know step one to where we are now um and i think that can be a really great resource for for anyone who's interested in getting more technical or learning about certain kinds of products um, at one point, uh, Stripe's support team was so incredibly overwhelmed by the growth of the business that we couldn't get back to support inquiries for days. We had customers who were waiting you know, four or five days for a reply from our team. And uh, what we did at that time was because we just couldn't hire support people fast enough, um, was we did a support rotation for everyone in the company. So, um, you know, usually like one full day uh every two weeks or so, you would uh, have a day of doing tickets um, all day. And it was really instrumental in helping fix the problem of getting customers back, to, uh, getting back to customers quickly, obviously, and that was the ultimate goal. But I think it had this secondary effect, which was it taught everyone to really understand the product and really step into the shoes of the customer. So even if you read the docs, let's say, like there's no replacement for understanding what a user is trying to do, um, like what's not intuitive about it in the product based on what they're trying to do and how to help them help themselves. Um, so, you know, you might read the documentation for a product like Stripe, but you aren't running like you know, an online e-commerce store. <laughs> um, and so when someone says like, hey, I'm trying to like make a refund and I'm making this call to the API in order to do it, like it's not working, right? Um, trying to understand like why they're trying to do what they're trying to do and like how you can best solve the problem, which may not be solving it in the way that they thought um, they could solve it is, is really critical. And it ended up being quite the blessing overall because we learned so much about how to improve the product itself, our support tooling, documentation, all those things. And if we wouldn't have learned that, we would have just left support up to the support team. And I think there wouldn't necessarily be as much like cross-functional connectivity. Um, so at Linear, for example, uh, the leader of our support team does support tickets. It's not just people who are, you know, directly in the role, um, you know, as an IC. We give everyone in the company who joins training on how we do support and how we interact with users. Um, you know, you'll find me responding to support requests on Twitter from all of these people. Um, you know, there's really no level or role where you don't get value out of that. Um, so even if you're not asked to do it as part of your job, um, you know, like we had people do at Stripe, um, I would recommend that everyone volunteer to do support and do it somewhat regularly if you're building a product, if you're building product knowledge and technical fluency. Um, so would highly recommend everyone to do that if you haven't yet. Um, there can be an intimidation factor in learning new technical skills as a non-technical person, especially within a company that's highly technical. Um, I often reminded myself that while an engineer on the team has a lot of strengths in certain areas, I also have strengths in other areas, and there's nothing that either of us have that's like fundamentally unlearnable. And at the first startup I worked for, um, you know, it was 20 people at this time. We didn't have a data scientist. So um, eventually um, I asked one of the engineers on the team who was pulling data on his own time to understand like, you know, how many users do we have and how many of them are still active? Like those kind of basic questions. Um, I asked him if he could teach me how to use SQL so I could start pulling my, my own data and then running some cohort analysis. And I started by just doing the things that I felt were simplest, which were just like copying existing queries that are already existed, um, or doing things like editing queries um, that were already in existence as well and seeing if I could tweak them. Um, and then eventually, like I worked my way to building my own queries from scratch. 
And the engineering team loved it because, you know, they weren't asked to do random data pools by me or really anyone else in the company anymore. And slowly I became the person who would update everyone on like how our cohorts were performing. So at Stripe, there were a bunch of people who started working in supporter sales and then eventually, you know, became more and more and more technical over time and then eventually became like engineers on the engineering team. Um, a lot of that, you know, is being at an organization that encourages this like growth mindset and this idea that you can learn more. Um, but, you know, in a lot of cases, people were doing classes or courses outside of work and doing that on their own time and becoming more technically skilled. Um, and personally, like, I don't believe that's where my greatest skills are. So like, I don't think I'm going to become an engineer necessarily anytime soon. Um, but it's important that you believe that it's learnable. Um, and when you take an online course or, you know, try to figure out a new skill or just simply ask someone if they'd be open to teaching you, um, you can become the non-technical person who becomes technical. Um, and I think being open to making that transition, if it's a need for the company and two, it's like a personal interest of yours, um, you know, I think is a great step. We've talked a lot about how you can become more technical, but it's important to also value your own contribution if you decide not to become technical and figure out, you know, how you can in turn add value to your technical counterparts. Um, there should be some kind of mutual value exchange that you're learning from them, but they're also learning from you. And they should understand your role and how you can help support them or the company's goals. But the company isn't going to do this for you. Like you have to play an active role in that. Um, and for example, if you're in a role talking to customers, um, you know, you can do these three things, which will, I think, ultimately build a better working relationship with engineering product and design teams. Um, you know, one, for example, I've always found that like hearing it straight from a customer in terms of like product feedback is always the best, but again, not all engineers can be in every product meeting with a customer that you might have. So second best is really um, getting a really concise summary from you as to how that interaction went or what the product feedback was. Um, if there's a bug report, you should collect as much information as possible so that an engineer could reproduce or diagnose the issue without a ton of back and forth. And if you have feature ideas, bring specifics on not just what the feature request is. That's the easy thing to do. If someone says like, hey, I want X, can you give me X? And you just take that and like paste it into the like product feedback channel in Slack. But what you're ultimately trying to do is figure out what the customer is trying to achieve. Like what is the outcome that they want? And ideally you're in a company where you're not just aiming to solve the direct need of the customer, but you're trying to solve the bigger problem right? Not just implement it exactly as they want it to be implemented. Um, sometimes, you know, it's like the classic, like someone, um, uh, you know, if you ask people like, would you have wanted a car? They would have said, no, they would have wanted uh, faster horses. Um, uh, and in a lot of cases, they don't always know what they want or what the best technical implementation or solution is. So I find the best way of working with engineers is to approach it very similarly, where you don't have a particular outcome in mind, um, but you have a problem that needs to be solved and you can collaborate with them in order to fix it. Um, so those are basically my, my lessons for today on how to become more technical. Um, if you're curious to just like find out more about me, here's where you can find me on the internet. Um, but uh, I figure we'll go through maybe some of the questions in the Q&A. So if you have um, questions now, feel free to add them in there. I'll start answering. Um, Let's see, um, from your experience, what is the most effective and efficient way to establish um, a shared language within a team's culture? Um, so I guess like one thing is starting by observation. Um, so sometimes it's like, uh, especially at a lot of technology companies, like they're like heavy on acronyms. Um, a, a good example of this uh, when I was at Stripe was the equivalent of someone saying like, like A C K in Slack, and I was just like, "What? Like, what does that mean?" Uh, and then you realize, like, it's short for like acknowledged, right? Um, so you know, someone seeing something and being like, "Oh, got it," you know. 
And um, so in a lot of cases, we started building out this almost like dictionary of like words that were used in the company. And some some of this was like purely cultural, but I, I would say because it was such an engineering driven, driven company, it was a lot of like technical language um, that was then used in non-technical ways. Um, so there was kind of this, uh, you know, list of words that was going around the company and, and how it was used. Um, and then second, I would always just be in a position where you feel comfortable asking, like, you know, you might feel like weird being the person being like, oh, like, what, what does that mean? Um, or like, I don't understand what that acronym is. Like, can you explain it to me? Um, but you should be that person. That's like, the most effective way to learn um, when you're in conversation. Um, and then if you're the person who's kind of like documenting this list of like shared language in the company um, and then sharing that with others, it can really help any person who joins after you, any new hires, like just understand like what's being said, how it's being communicated and like what the shared languages within a particular team's culture. Um, and then beyond that, I think when you get into like product specifics of like, how does this product work? How is it talked about? Um, I think doing a little bit of what I talked about in terms of like reading the documentation, figuring out how the company describes certain products in certain ways, reading it back to people and saying, is this how you would describe it, um, can also be really helpful to establish shared language when it comes to like products and product development. Um, how do you train your team to do support? Um, I would say, uh, we start with generally like at linear, for example, like maybe a 30 to 45 minute overview of like the different components of the product. Um, you know, how does it work? Like, what are the support tools that we use? You know, are you using, um, intercom or Zendesk or those kinds of things. And then I think you pretty quickly have to just get into the tickets. Um, and I think the easiest way is just to like get a ticket and figure out how to solve it and then take the maybe draft that you have of a particular ticket and then share that with someone else who's on the support team and basically get that same feedback loop. Like, hey, like here are 10 tickets that I have drafts on. Can you read them and then maybe make edits? And then I can look at the edits and figure out like, what did I miss or what did I get wrong in terms of how I described it? Um, and that's generally the best way to learn. Like you want to be someone who's just like constantly learning from this feedback and this iteration um, rather than just saying like, oh, great, someone edited it for me, like send. Like you want to actually understand like what were the changes made so that you don't make that same mistake again. Um, so I think the, the most effective way is just get in it and have a partner who can like advise and, and help you um, throughout the way. Um, let's see going through a bunch of questions here. See what's interesting. Uh, are there any books you recommend for operators? Um, I actually think there's like a really great book um, from Claire Hughes Johnson, uh, who's the former COO of Stripe about scaling people. Um, so it kind of talks about organizations and how people work. Um, but there's like some technical components, like thinking about um, your operating principles within a, a company, um, how you decide to do certain things and why, like what are your values, um, and then channeling that to like an operating system. So like, how do you actually work within an organization? How do you do one-on-ones? Do you have meetings? Like, how do you unblock people when they're blocked? Um, and I actually found it to be really great if you're in like a non-technical role and just figuring out how to like operate better with others. Um, and then um, if you're interested in, um, you know, kind of thinking about things from the perspective, um, uh, of engineers, uh, Stripe Press uh, produced this really great book um, uh, around like kind of like the engineer's uh, manual. Um, so I would encourage you to like look at that and, and you know, again, read it as if you're an engineer. Uh, it's the engineering manager's manual or engineering manager's handbook. I'm like forgetting the exact phrase, yeah. um, but it, it's written by Will Larson, um, who is now CTO at Carta. Um, so would highly recommend like reading that as well. If you're just trying to figure out like, how do engineering teams work? Um, how do they operate? How do they think? Um, and it is like quite different from like a typical, uh, maybe like non-technically like oriented team, um, as well. Um, okay. Question. How do you present this technical experience on your resume or LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Um, obviously this has value, but at the same time, I don't want to oversell my skills. 
Um, honestly, like, I feel like it's hard to uh, talk about it in the context of, of a resume or on, on your LinkedIn, like how you are like technically fluent. Um, I think it comes through often more so from experience, like talking about like, how have you worked with technical counterparts um, and talking through the interactions of like how those teams worked differently and how you managed working with them. Um, and, and so to me, it's less of a resume like value ahead uh, and more of a interview value add. So when someone asks you a question like, um, you know, how did you work with technical counterparts, you know, that you were selling to, for example, being able to give a really thoughtful answer um, about how you did that, um, you know, without just saying like, oh, I was purely a salesperson. I was giving them an order form. I was walking them through a sales deck and like really talk about how you're getting deep with those counterparts in a way that's different. Um, and then in addition to that, talking about how you work with your internal counterparts and how your relationships like improved in terms of, um, both like your technical fluency over time, um, as well as like their interaction with you and what the value exchange was, right? Like I kind of talked about a little earlier, just like, uh, what are the things that you are giving to them and what are the things that they are giving to you in return and kind of talking through that as something that you gained and improved throughout your experience at your you know, current company. Um, so I think it comes across far better from like an interview perspective than it does from like a resume builder perspective um, and, you know, can make you stand out in terms of um, the back and forth and how you can be effective um, in an organization. Um, let's see. What other questions have not been answered? We've got a lot here, so I'm just scrolling through. Uh, how have you navigated ops or non-technical roles in early stage companies pre-seed seed when the majority of focus of the company is on engineering? Um, so I would say generally the way that I've looked at, uh, maybe like ops roles. So in my mind, that's more like support or product operations or something like that. Um, very much so as a role that is like the voice of the customer type of role, right? Again, like, especially at early stage companies, not every engineer um, is in conversations with customers, knows what customers wants, what the feedback is. And I find that the best way to kind of make yourself known in an operations role um, is to deliver concise and clear summarized feedback across the board um, around what customers feel and think about your product um, and deliver that back to like the engineering product and design teams um, so that you're not just someone who's like reactively responding to a queue of tickets or um, questions from customers, but you're also taking that knowledge and data and translating it back for the engineering product and design teams. So to me, it's like not just, you know, like re reacting and responding to customers is like a level, like being level one in an ops role maybe, um, but building upon that feedback, translating it, giving it back to engineering product design is like your way to level up um, and be perceived as someone who's adding a lot of value within an, an engineering driven organization. Um, so I think that's the best way to just kind of navigate and like, add value. But I, I would say that like, it's something that you have to build, build at over time. Um, and maybe I'll just answer one more question because we're at 1030. Um, what are the key skills that an IC needs to acquire to grow into a management role? Um, I would say number one, you should be like a really strong IC. Um, I find it pretty rare to give a management role to someone who is not a very high performing IC first. Um, so I just, you know, first focus on like being really great at your current role. Um, second is like, can you show the additional skills that are required, not just to be a great individual contributor, but to be a great manager. And the best way to do that is to be like a great peer to the rest of your team as an IC. So think about, you know, as an example, we had a salesperson join recently and they were like, Hey, I've, I found this like technique 
is really working um, with these customers that I'm talking to, you know, this like technique of doing this particular kind of outreach or something like that. And it would be really easy as a salesperson to say, I'm going to keep that little tidbit to myself and be the best I see and have the best, um, you know, output numbers for the sales team. But instead he took his knowledge and said, Hey, everyone else should learn from this. It's going to make it easier for you to get customers to respond to you. Um, and so taking the learnings that you have as an IC and trying to make other people around you better um, would be a really strong skill set that I would say translates as an IC into a manager. Um, and then I would say the last ones are like figuring out how to spot problems, spot opportunities for growth. Um, and then be a key advisor to your manager about how the team was performing, how you think the team can be better. Um, and just like wanting to grow and increase your impact. So showing that um, as an IC over time um, can help you uh, be perceived as someone who's ready for the next step uh, as a manager. Okay, well, I think that's it for today. Um, Thanks to everyone uh, who came and ans asked questions and was able to listen. If you have any more questions, um, maybe you could ask them on Twitter and maybe I'll get them, uh, get to them later today if I didn't get to them here. So thank you. Bye. Thanks, Christina. Bye everyone.